right. We are on the stage now. Oh, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, thanks a lot for attending our second special data science symposium. And here is our second paper session. And uh, the topic for this specific session is about geospatial insights. And uh, we have three wonderful papers accepted for this, for this session. And uh, the first one uh, is about the spatial linked data approach for trace data in digital humanities. And the presenter here is uh, Francisca from the uh, Greece University of Technology. Uh, Francisca, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be part of this symposium. So let's try to share the screen and then get started. So I hope it's working. So welcome to my presentation showing a spatial link data approach for trace data and digital humanities. Well, let me give you first a short introduction to the topic. So there is a web of things in the world described by data on the web, which is defined as web of data. You might have heard of it, but it is not just, just about data, it is about linking the data. And by combining linked data and geo-information, a geosemantically enriched, um, a geospatial enriched semantic web comes to existence. So Bernalis defined the the linked data principles, which are about using HTTP URIs as names for things. He also recommends to provide further, further links to resources and descriptions so that people can discover more things. So this thought of linking motivates also this work. Other intentions of this work are the work on um, spatiotemporal enabled ontology based on the linked pasts ontology to create a knowledge graph including the linked pasts ontology supporting the linked places format and giving an option to include linked traces also to integrate linked data repositories especially existing project with the focus on historical data and extend the given ontologies as needed Thus, it is also data-driven approach. Then, as a proof of concept, a spatial endpoint, including the created geo knowledge graph, is implemented. And finally, the resulting link traces approach is evaluated with regards to geosemantic capabilities. So that was short introduction, and but let's take a look at the background also. So. The development of linked paths led to the linked places format. The linked places format is concepted to be not an overall solution. It is a uniform way to link different gazetteers and include just enough metadata to support the search across different gazetteers. So, for example, here we see two different conceptual models defining a place. Both are linked via their identifiers. And the linked place format includes also place name, type, location, and relation that are connected to a certain time span. And that's it. So other options are within other uh, formats and data sources. Well, next it uh, is the linked traces format. In general, the term trace refers to web published resources, so-called trace data in the form of World Wide Web Consortium web annotations. The web resource itself is the annotation target. That might be any kind of text, the data set, image, sound, video, and the annotation body embeds RDF as text. With its ID attribute, the annotation body can also link to an external RDF record, for example, describing a place, holding a certain historical artifact, event, or person um, at a certain time. So a trace can also consist of a sum of events like Darwin's expeditions, for example, or certain war with its battlefields. 
So the link traces format is in its infancy, but the World Historical Gazetteer community intends to develop develop the format further and uses already example traces within the platform. So the last background information I want to give you is about knowledge graphs. Basically, a knowledge graph is a structured way of combining data and ontologies. And the benefit is that it is human and machine readable. It consists of data dribbles in form of subject, predicate, and object. And because of this simple structure, knowledge graphs are efficiently explore, explorable and linkable. Already a lot of entries within knowledge spaces are spatial. For example, linked geodata holds about 3 billion geographic entries. Also the open street map data collection is included. So by entering the methodological approach chapter, first the data sources are of relevance. Data sources for linked places and thus potential linked traces or parts of linked traces are listed in this figure. World Historical Gazette already includes exemplar traces. Also country data sets are of interest to extend the possibility of spatial querying. And all these data sets are imported to GraphDB, a semantic graph database. So the already shown conceptual model of linked places is a simplified model of the linked paths ontology. There are several classes that describe a place like name attestation, type attestation and link attestation. Especially the time span is defined very well and named with when. You can see it here in green. And for example, it, it gives the option to define a start and end with different time formats and also a period or a time span. This image is um, a visual graph represented in graph DP. So it's just the imported semantic data model, the basis for all of the work. So because of the given data and a few ontology extensions are necessary, for example, within the given trace that data, the definition of an historical entity like event is missing. Thus, an event is not clearly identifiable. One solution is to create a composite ID as a workaround to handle the event time spans of a place annotation. Otherwise, it would be impossible to lead from an event back to a trace or a place. And by merging now all separate graphs, including the test data and ontologies extensions, and an, an overall geo knowledge graph is resulting. One option to investigate the graph is to use GraphDP just by clicking through the link triples and check the class relationships. But to show the functionality of the graph, spatial functions as well as filtering the graph via attributes and also querying time is tested here. So this is just a small example. Here the results of two queries are shown. The spatial query using the function SF within. So it's a GeoSparkle uh, query. Use, it uh, uses the country geometry of Chile to select all points within the country lines. And these points are highlighted in yellow. The result of the second query using an attribute filter is shown in green. It includes also points surrounding the coastlines of Chile. So here within the data set, we also have the information of a country, but it's not a spatial one. So just attribute filtering. But depending on the defined questions to be answered, both options of querying are possible using the geo knowledge graph as a basis. By searching a certain trace and asking for its historical events, also ordering the events by time is possible. So the query is resulting in a list of places like shown here and its event types with the according start and end time. In this case, years. Trace nine is describing the events of the first and second Punic Wars. So here time format is always the same, but by querying all traces, several other formats are detected. And the result is 
that all shown formats here are supported and ordered correctly. So that's working quite fine. One minute. Now the main result is the merged geo knowledge graph created in GraphDP, the extension of the linked past ontology as kind of workaround as shown here with event and trace. And here we see that places are sometimes stages for more than one event. For example, five events as of three different races were taking place at Babylon. Well, integrating lists and hierarchical structures was quite challenging. All data has to be reduced to the simple structure of data triple, thus lists need IDs to correctly map them. Starting with the data to extend a given ontology might cause problems to include just enough metadata to link and not more than that. Some benefits are that no data gets lost by integrating it to a knowledge graph and mapping it correctly. Also, all used time formats are supported. And the given linked places format is providing possibilities to include all kinds of descriptions and links and also different geometry types and formats. Thus, in terms of geosemantics, places are basically well describable and can be enriched with context as needed. So, in the future, it would be an option to develop the linked past ontology further and integrate other relevant ontologies like the simple event ontology. It is also possible to integrate more historical data sets of different projects in order to gain further knowledge about history. And after that, the resulting geo knowledge graph should be published for the scientific community to follow the motivation of linking. So, yeah. Thank you for your attention. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your comments and questions at the end of the session. Thanks a lot, uh, Francesca. So yes, please tap in your questions in the chat or tapping your questions in the QA tabs. So our next presenter uh, is Peter uh, Reinecker from the University of Zurich. And he's gonna present his work about hidden spatial clusters and how to find them. Peter, the stage is yours. Well, thanks a lot, Ruiz. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm Peter. I'm originally uh, by training a geographer and a GS scientist, but I have now uh, been working on a project together with evolutionary biologists and with linguists. And in this project, we try to reconstruct the evolution of languages in space and time. Um, now, language is probably as old as humanity. And um, as humans have evolved, also, language has evolved over the past well, centuries and the past millennia even. And in this project, we try to reconstruct and to uncover and to infer that evolution of languages in space and time. Now, one of the phenomenal processes that we study is particularly intriguing and particularly interesting, and it's language contact. Now, in language contact, well, you see here two people speaking two different languages, and when these people speaking these two different languages are in contact with each other, they are likely to assimilate and to exchange properties. Now, in this particular case, uh, the person on the right she changes one of her properties and she adapts to the property of the person on the left. And now you might wonder, well, what could such a property be that, that uh, people in, uh, or that people of different languages um, adapt to or change when in contact? Actually, the word language itself is such a property. So the word language in English was actually borrowed from French. And when the, so when the Normans invaded um, Great Britain back in the 11th century, they brought with them their culture and they also brought with them their language and they brought with them the concept of, well, the word language. And so the English thought or the British thought, this is, um, well, a good word, a good idea to call this phenomenon language and they adapted and they took the word from the French and since now have been calling languages, languages. Um, now, there are three important things when it comes to language evolution. First, um, or when it comes to language contact. First, 
Um, well, language contact not only affects well one single feature, but it can affect well several different features. So it's not just that feature A that you see here that might be affected by language contact, but it's all sorts of different kinds of features that can be accepted, affected. The second thing is usually languages don't just, um, it's not only two languages that are in contact with each other, but it can be well, several contact, uh, several languages that are in contact. And these languages are what we call in a contact area. So languages in a particular area exchange with each other, exchange properties, and this makes these languages more similar. And as of the third thing is that what I have shown you before is that, um, well, this language context can show us a lot of past human interaction. So, so we can learn a lot of, um, well, our past and our history of, as a species from language context. Um, for example, we, we know through this example of the Normans uh, invading Britain, um, or the, the, the word language being adopted into Britain, British language, we know that the, the, well, the Normans, that is because of the Normans. So languages, interaction and contact shows us a lot about the past, our past as a human, as, as a species. Um, now, what we try to uh, do in this project is um, to show, actually, find areas of past language contact. And when I started this project, this seemed to be super simple or I thought it's going to be super simple. I thought I'm going to simply apply methods from uh, geospatial clustering and apply these methods to, well, find similar areas or find languages that are similar and return them as context areas. But it turns out, um, so here you can see, for example, such a context area, or you can see um, languages that are similar. And, um, well, it turns out that it's not so simple and we cannot simply use um, out of the box um, language um, algorithms to cluster uh, to find language contact in space. There are at least two important confounding facts um, that make this impossible. So when I returned my first results, my first spatial clustering results, uh, where I said, look, I found spatial contact of languages um, in the data to the linguists, uh, when I first returned uh, these, they would say, well, Look, uh, there are at least two confounding effects, and one of them is universal preference, and one of them is inheritance that lead to the same effect. So they also lead to languages becoming more similar. And these overshadow the similarities due to contact. Now, universal preference is no matter if we are speaking Chinese or English or Japanese or French, we are all humans and we have, um, well, our brains work similar, and so do our languages. And so some of the concepts in our language they are actually not, um, well, they are not similar because of, of um, context, but they are just similar because we as humans are similar and our needs for language are similar. Um, another important confounding effect here is inheritance. Now, if I told you that these languages here, for example, were Italian, French, um, Spanish, and Portuguese, you would immediately say, well, okay, all of these four languages, they are related and we know their ancestor very well. It was Latin. So it's a little surprised that all of these languages are now similar. But the similarities that they share is not due to contact, it's due to inheritance. It's due to inheritance from a common ancestor. So you see that there is, um, well, confounding effects that make simply using clustering algorithms to find contact areas almost impossible. Now, what would we do? we would develop an algorithm that is called S-Base. And S-Base stands for a spatial Bayesian clustering algorithm. And this clustering algorithm finds hidden spatial clusters. It learns which similarities, so which similar features in a set of language cannot be explained by the confounding effect of universal preference and of inheritance. And it tries to cluster the remaining similarities. So what you can see here is um, um, the application of this S-based algorithm. That's actually from a publication, from a recent publication from last year, where we applied um, the S-based algorithm to find language contact in the Americas. So what, this is the contact areas that we found, and these are now areas where languages are similar, but they are similar in a special way. They are similar such that these similarities are not explained by universal preference, and they are not explained by inheritance. And thus, because 
this algorithm can distinguish between different types of um, similarities, we call it an algorithm for finding hidden spatial clusters. Now, in this presentation, I would like to introduce the, the idea of S-space and the idea of finding, well, hidden spatial clusters whose similarity is not, ex is not explained by confounding effect to a more geographical audience. Because I think the idea of having similarities in a set of spatial data where we know actually the origin and wanting to exclude those similarities for clustering applies to several different um, fields in geography and in spatial data analysis. And I will give you um, three examples now. Um, in the short paper that uh, we specifically uh, made for this workshop, we um, came up with a fictional case study where we try to cluster similar behavior, similar mobility behavior in space. But we tried to, we simulated the, simu the mobility behavior such that we had a confounding effect. And in this case, the confounding effect was given by sociodemographics. Specifically, we would have a different age groups. So you see here the young participants, the working age participants, and the elderly participants. And these different age groups would each have a particular mobility pattern. But what you can also see here is that we simulated two spatial clusters. And in these spatial clusters, the mobility behavior is similar. So we simulated a, a mobility behavior that's more leaning towards um, individual motorized trans, uh, transport in the Western cluster and more towards public transport in the Eastern cluster. But then on top of it, we also we simulated the similarities due to the confounding effects. And if we take everything together, you see that you have this pattern that's almost indistinguishable to a regular clustering algorithm it would probably not be able to find these spatial patterns that exist in the data, as you can see. But using this uh, clustering algorithm that takes into account the confounding effect of, well, of confounders, and in this case of social demographics of age, um, S-Space is able to retrieve um, the clusters that Amazing. we simulated. Um, we are currently um, applying this algorithm or the idea on um, several case studies. Um, so um, one of them is um, finding similar biodiversity and doing so by counting for the confounding effect of, of climate, soil and geology. So we could imagine that these three factors have a, lot, have, had, have a huge impact on biodiversity, but we could imagine that there, is, there are spatial patterns that exist when these um, confounding factors have been taken um, care of. Um, then one other idea is using S-Space to um, cluster similar socioeconomic activities in space while accounting for different policies and different regulations. And the third one um, to cluster similar diseases in, in space or similar prevalence for disease in space accounting for uh, well, the conditions or pre-existing conditions of, of patients. So this is already the final slide. Um, I presented today to you coming an algorithm coming from actually linguistics and finding or spatial linguistics, if you wish, uh, that finds um, areas of past language contact and it does so by learning which similarities are due to the actual causal aerial effect and which similarities are due to confounders. And thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Peter. Very interesting work. So again, attendees, feel free to ask the questions via the chat or you know the QA session there, and we are going to address them at the end. So uh, last but not the <coughs> least, uh, let's welcome our next presenter, uh, Janato and he's going to present us his work on data augmentation for spatial disease mapping. Renato, uh, you can share your screen and start. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, we can, but we cannot see your slides. It's here. Um, so, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Renato Assunção. I'm the third author here. And this is a joint work with Rafaela Diniz, who is in Simon Fraser University now, 
and my colleague Pedro Vaz de Mello. Uh, this work is about data augmentation for spatial disease mapping. Many machine learning algorithms, they rely on large amount of data. Evaluation is made by splitting the data set into training and testing samples. No distribution of assumptions about the data is required. And this uh, splitting procedure, it allows us to avoid overfitting and control for bias predictions. What can we do when the data set is scarce as in the disease mapping situation? So data augmentation is a technique that is used in machine learning to artificially increase the amount of data by adding slightly randomly distorted replicas of the training samples. The random distortion must be small to avoid destroying the intrinsic correlation present in the training samples, but at the same time, it must be large enough to produce samples that are substantially distinct from the training examples. It allows machine learning models to be trained more accurately. So a typical data augmentation procedure with image process processing is this situation here where we have this original image of a cat and then we augment the data, just introducing slight variations in the original image. Or this one here, which also just uh, is uh, augmented by creating new images that are slightly uh, different, uh, slight variations in the original image. Now, unlike typical machine learning data sets, in many spatial analysis, we only have a single map. As, for example, in the previous um, uh, presentation that we had. The spatial units are not independent examples, and it's like having a single image to make inference. We have just one single map. This is exactly the situation in disease mapping. And in this disease mapping situation, we have a map partition in n areas indexed by i, each area has a population, Ni, and a certain number of disease cases represented by Yi. We assume that Yi is defined by a probabilistic distribution, such as Yi being a Poisson uh, variable, random variable, with a theta i rate per capita rate of disease, and Ni is the population. So theta i is the proportion of people that get disease during a certain time period. And the goal typically in, this, in, in detecting, for example, cluster of disease in, in this map is, uh, is, is to try to find clusters, spatial clusters, um, to where this rate is substantially larger than in the rest of the map. There are several algorithms to do that, but our goal here is to provide examples that help in evaluate these algorithms. And we do this by generating perturbed versions of the map where each area follows the same underlying distribution of the original map. Not only each area, but the entire map has uh, retains the, the same spatial pattern. And in this case, we have two different uh, model-free methods to generate these patterns, the several spatial maps from the data generating process. And one of the methods is the bootstrap sample, and the other is the rewiring samples. So the bootstrap samples, we, what, what we do is just remembering here the notation. In area I, we have Ni as the population size, Yi is the number of disease cases. And let's suppose that theta is the disease rate per capita that could change area by area, or it can just be a constant number. Each J's individual flips a coin. If it's heads, then it's considered a disease case. So we, th this is the model that we have for, to, to analyze the, the disease cases in this map. ZIJ is this outcome of this coin for the J's individual in the ice area. So if it's one is a disease case, zero otherwise. And theta is the probability of being a case. So the total number of cases at the end is just a binomial distribution that can be approximated under certain assumptions uh, to the uh, by the Poisson distribution. So th th this is just the total number of cases in area I given the number of people there. So now the, what the bootstrap samples does is we're just repeating here. This is the total number of cases. What we do is for each J's individual we flip 
another coin, now is heads probability pi and having an outcome, wij. If wij is one, we keep the j's individual, being it a case or not a case, a disease case or not. Otherwise, we delete this individual from the synthetic map that we are creating. So the original map has this number of cases in each one of the areas. But then after this randomly deleting some individuals with probability pi i, we create a pseudo map, a synthetic map, conditionally on the number of people in each one of the areas, where we have now this new number of people in each one of the area, n i star, which is again a binomial distribution with the total number of individuals there in a probability pi of being selected and the number of disease cases, which is given by this one. What is important here, and I'm not showing because of lack of time, is that what we, what we guarantee is that by doing this, we generate a synthetic map where all the spatial patterns in the original map are retained in this synthetic map. So this is just a description of uh, what we do in each one of the areas. We select a few people to be deleted and um, some of them are cases like the red ones and the green ones are not cases. Or, uh, and then we flip a coin or ram, ram, roll a dice and, and then some of them are retained uh, in the original, in the synthetic map. So we repeat this for each one of the areas in the map. And at the end, after iterating over all areas, we have a randomly generated synthetic map. Each synthetic, we can generate many of these synthetic maps. And this, each, of, each, each one of them has a smaller number of cases and population. Each area holds approximately a proportion pi of its population and number of disease cases. But the important aspect is that the synthetic map maintains the same spatial pattern of the original map, whatever is this spatial pattern. There is one disadvantage, although, it's that areas with zero cases, we always have zero cases because we don't create cases. We always delete people and occasionally they are also disease cases, but we never create cases. So if originally the map has zero cases, zero disease cases, it will remain with zero cases. So the rewiring procedure is a way out of this, of this problem. In each area, we may rewire a small proportion of its cases to neighboring areas. So just to make it very uh, quick and short, we in each one of the areas, we have this number of cases, which will be now a certain amount of people from the original map. This Ki is just a proportion of the original number of, of disease cases in the area, plus a certain number of people that come from the neighboring areas. This Ri gen, then is just additional cases coming from the neighbors. The formula is more complicated here, but basically what we do is we keep the same spatial pattern in this synthetic map that we create as it is present in the original map. So the idea is that in each one of the areas, like area 33 here, we select a few, num a few disease cases to be um, deleted from the area, but at the same time, we add some areas in 33 that come from its neighboring areas. So the, in this rewriting situation, the population size is not altered. The, the total number of disease cases is not also uh, altered. Uh, it remains the same. Uh, only the number of cases in each one of the areas can change, but not the total number of ca cases. One minute. But most important, the underlying spatial pattern is the same as the original maps. So we can simulate scenarios with these synthetic maps. So for what is the reason for using this augmented data? We have two uses that we, we, we give in a more complete paper than this one. One is we propose two metrics based on this augmented data to evaluate the stability of the spatial disease cluster detection algorithms. So good algorithms should learn a spatial disease cluster that is stable when you look at many different spatial maps from the same underlying distribution 
but slightly different from each other. So small perturbations in the map should not mess with the unknown underlying generating uh, with the, 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 the disease cluster detection algorithm. Now, the second use is that we propose a framework to quantify the weight of the evidence that an area actually belongs to the real anomaly. So rather than evaluating algorithms, we suppose that you decide but for to use one given algorithm. Then what we do is we quantify how sure you can be that a given detected area really belongs to the true underlying anomaly or the cluster when using that uh, said algorithm. So in conclusion, we presented two methods to augment disease maps, bootstrap samples and rewiring samples. The methods are capable of generating a large number of different synthetic maps from the real data. The spatial pattern from the original map is retained in the synthetic maps, and the methods provide enough diversity to allow generalization capabilities for machine learning algorithms. And they do not need any prior information or probabilistic assumption about the, the data set. With this, I thank you very much, and I will be open to answer your questions. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Renato. Thanks a lot for our three presenters here to present their great work here. Uh, so we have some time for the audience to ask questions. So you can either type in it into the chat or just raise your hands, and then I can bring you onto the stage to talk with the uh, authors here, uh, please. Any questions? Well, uh, maybe while we are waiting for the audience to tap in or you know find a way to raise their hands using this new platform, maybe I can ask a question. So maybe first related to uh, to Renato's. Uh, uh, this data augmentation algorithm. So I was wondering, you know, you claimed that, you know, the spatial pattern does not change while you do this bootstrap sampling and also wearing. Uh, I'm wondering whether you quantitatively, you know, measured the spatial patterns because there are, there are many measurements to quantify a spatial pattern, right? You can have the density or intensity, but meanwhile, you can have the, the like the replace K for the point patterns. Have you considered yes, no. this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, of course, when we generate the synthetic maps, you get you you have different numbers. So how what what I mean by having the same exact spatial pattern because the numbers are different. Right. What what we mean is that the probabilistic distribution remains the same. So you so if you, if you have the tendency to have a, a a certain cluster in a given area, this cluster really stays there when you get the synthetic maps. And if this cluster, or suppose that you have two areas, one neighbor of each other, and one is twice as much cases than the other, you can have slight variations, but typically mm -hmm. on average, you have always in these synthetic maps, twice mm -hmm. numbers, twice um, more cases here than in the other one. So you keep the, the, the joint spatial pattern in, mm -hmm. in the two met methods. The rewiring one, is not complete is not so strict as in the first one in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, it is only approximately the same spatial pattern but we did quantify that with you know formulas and mathematics uh -huh. in the paper great so it's more on global spatial pattern rather than local spatial pattern right because your spatial regions pattern still changes actually there it it is it is local in the sense of the probability distribution I see. Not in the sense of the observed numbers. So I if you, you no, know, you know, if you have a Poisson variation, you, mm -hmm. uh, random variable, you generate many numbers. It will be different uh, every time, but the distribution remains the same. Got it. Makes sense. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have one question from the audience. I will bring uh, Yano onto the stage. Oops, sorry. Uh, maybe I will read this one and then I will bring Yano here. Uh, Yano's question is about the spatial scope of type assignments. Uh, maybe I still need to bring Yano here because this question is not that explicit. Uh, let me find Yano. Oh, okay. Hey, and my question was to, to Francisca's work about the linked places and linked paths. When you assign types to certain places, for instance, city to Babylon or whatnot, and how do you deal with temporal scoping there so that the place type assignment isn't 
over time. You are muted. Pardon, you mean that that the um, that the type is changing over time, or what is the question exactly? Yes, the the, the place type is changing over time, right? So it's only valid during certain time periods. Yes. How did um, you model that? Well, right now it's modeled that the that the place is uh, ha have its type, and then several time spans are linked to the place. And if the link, if the place um, changes over time, it's um, yeah, it's kind of neutrable. Then you you can just uh, say, okay, this place has now type this, and with this type, uh, also this the certain time is linked. So that's possible here. I don't know if I can describe it <laughs> right away. Oh, we can discuss later. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Francisca. So we have another question from the audience uh, from Andy. I will show it on stage and invite her here. Let me see. How can I do that? I think it's for me, right? The question. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm bringing Andy onto the stage. Okay. Andy, you can ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know um, if you want. Uh, go, go ahead. Please. Okay, hi Renato. I'll just I'll, I'll just speak it. Uh, so the re, the reassignment you're doing, the rearrangement, seems like it would only preserve the spatial distribution over a particular scale, uh, not at a smaller scale or at a larger scale. Well, I don't know what you mean by a particular scale, a geographical scale, or a scale of the yeah. numeric values, or. Uh, so a problem. So a spatial distribution, you know, is a. You know, it's defined over a certain area, right? So um, it would only, there's like a, a minimum area over which it would be, you have a particular spatial distribution. And if you rearrange things on that scale and at larger scales, um, that would, you'd have a similar distribution. But if you look at a, at a, smaller, a smaller scale, uh, you would be uh, changing the distribution. Well, the, the idea is to make this reassignment, either bootstrap or the, the rewriting, in the entire map. So you, in the, in the, for the bootstrap, what you have is a kind of a reduced image in the sense that suppose you use pi equal to, you know, 50%. So what you get is a, a, a new map with slightly different numbers for population and disease cases. There is a mirror image of the original map, the entire map, so everything there, but with about half of the population and about half of the disease cases in each one of the areas. And you can do this many times, so you have several replicas of this original map. So one of the questions would be, what is the good pi, what is the good uh, reduce, reduction that we should use in this case, or in the case of rewriting, uh, how should we make make the mixing but uh in, i don't know if i understood completely the question but uh, it it is you maintain the spatial distribution over the entire map not as i mean it's it's is the relative change the relative differences between areas that you change because for example for the bootstrap what you have is a 50 percent of the data there i mean cases and population but still, if if you have an increasing trend in the entire map, you, you also see the increasing trend in these synthetic maps. If you have cluster in some area, you should see the clusters also in, in all the synthetic maps. But there will be just slightly different uh, different versions of the original map. Okay, so you're sounds like you are set. You are actually setting a scale, which is the a particular region through which you're moving the data around. Um, when you say the entire map, you're talking about a particular region, right? No, it's, it's the map. I mean, suppose you get the United States and you are analyzing the census tract there. 
thousands of areas. So you 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 make the bootstrap over the entire for the thousands of census tract. You you have a new map of the United States, all the census tract, the area of analysis. So if you have a large scale an, an area of a, a large scale area to analyze. That's what you also have in the synthetic maps. You have versions of the original map, and they are entirely similar. Yeah. Okay. So you're yeah. you're you're talking Sorry. about the United Sorry. States, a large your particular geographic region, the United States. So you're moving things around within the United States. Um, Sorry that's, to the, that's the scale that I'm saying it, it that that would apply to. It wouldn't apply necessarily to a short or smaller scale, like within a state. Sorry to interrupt. Maybe uh, Andy and Renato, you can, uh, we can talk about this offline. I hope uh, Renato can stay a little bit around uh, so we can talk about this more uh, offline here. So uh, we are running a, a little bit of time, uh, but uh, there is one more question from the audience. I'm going to show it here. Uh, it's question is to uh, Francesca. Uh, so I would like uh, uh, like this uh, whether uh, you can see something about the scalability of the GeoSparkle queries in your work. Yes, I mean I don't understand the question. Maybe right, but uh, of course I test the GeoSparkle queries, but I don't know what what uh, is meant by scalability here. So so how large I'm your data sure. set is and the ah, okay. <laughs> there yeah well how large yeah i mean i used all countries of the world but not the finest resolution of course um otherwise i think uh, for for testing purposes i just use test data i haven't tested it yet with a very yeah a large scale here so and the, the places are just point data and uh simple polygons not yeah I cannot okay. say uh, something for sure here, but yeah, of course it should be tested if, um, yeah, how long the queries take and so on, of course. Okay, great. Because uh, we, we, we are also dealing with the GeoSparkle queries on our projects. They are the mm -hmm. issue, like when we have a large data set and we come to the spatial relations between geometries, when the data is large, there is a scalability issue here. So we'd like to hear from your comments. Uh, <laughs> Maybe later we can talk about this offline. All right, uh, everyone, we are running a little bit of, uh, out of time. So uh, I would like to, uh, everyone to you know, uh, give a big applause to our uh, speakers here, thanks to their wonderful talk. I have more questions also to Peter, and I will contact Peter later probably offline on the questions. Uh, and uh, we are going to have a break. And the next is going to be a keynote uh, session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there as well. All right, I'm going to end the session and feel free to join the tables in the social lounge as well. See you guys. Thank you very much. Bye.